colonizing the region, I spent a great deal of my time and effort uh, learning a, a language uh, and, and learning to use the language. Uh, and then when I finally went to, uh, to do uh, field studies in Southeast Asia and live among the people, then I had to learn their language as well. So I had to use the language that I learned from Indonesia to translate to another language to ultimately translate things back into uh, uh, English. Uh, so what I was doing uh, uh, over the last about uh, 15 years of on and off is writing a dictionary of the language of the people of Southeast Asia called Ludaya. Uh, if you go to the Anthropology Department website uh, and, you, and you go to something called research, faculty research projects or research projects, uh, you'll find a, a uh, you'll find two things there that are related to me. One is the, one is the digital ethnography project, which is a Trumpian studies project that I'm involved in. And on that, you can find my curriculum media if you want to read more boring facts about me. Uh, but also, there's another site called the Lundaya Study Site. And if you go to the Lundaya Study Site, you can uh, access a, a, a comprehensive bibliography of, uh, of uh, these people that live in central North Borneo called the Lundaya. But you can also access the, uh, the Kamalo Lundaya English Dictionary, which is this big, huge thing that, that is just now in, in, in being published. Uh, so I'm just, just now finishing that up. Anyway, I went to Cornell and I studied those languages and, uh, and I studied anthropology. I was lucky to be at Cornell at a time when, uh, uh, when uh, Victor Turner, uh, a famous British anthropologist of, of Scottish descent, decided to come across the pond and, and live with us. And so Victor Turner was an important influence on, on how that I learned to uh, do anthropology and study it. Uh, and uh, after, and while I was at Cornell, I was also, this was, this was during the Cold War, if you remember, this is 19, 1963 to 1966, sort of in that period. Uh, uh, the United States government had become involved in assisting uh, the Tibetans uh, uh, who were being uh, occupied by the, by the Chinese forces of Mao Zedong. Uh, and uh, one aspect of that was training Gongho uh, uh, Tibetan guerrillas uh, on the island of Saipan uh, in, in, in military tactics. Uh, another aspect of that program, most of these funded by the Central Intelligence Agency, was to train uh, people connected with His Holiness the Dalai Lama's office to act as, uh, as, as spokesmen for the Tibetan cause uh, in capitals around the world. And so uh, uh, six Tibetans were sent to, to New York, to Cornell, and, uh, and uh, we bought a house for them there called Tibet House and put them up and, uh, and I was hired as the, as the cultural instructor to teach them about Western ways of speaking and, 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 and doing things. And we had a political scientist instructor and we had an English instructor teach them about, about writing English. So, and that was, uh, I, I was involved with that for two years as well and, and, and that was most interesting. And, and, most important part of that, I guess, is that among the, the first group that came was uh, was Nawan Gelet. Nawan Gelet was the abbot of the, uh, the largest monastery in central Tibet, a monastery called Gupung, which is about 60 miles from the capital of Hasa. Uh, uh, he was the spiritual leader of a, of a, of a, of a monastery that had over 10,000 uh, monks that, that lived there and, and studied. Uh, but most importantly, he was, uh, he was about 23 years old, and uh, he was the seventh reincarnation of himself. He was a living bodhisattva, and he was a most interesting man to, to, to try to be a teacher of, and ultimately to become a student of. So that was an important part of, uh, of my education as well, is, uh, is working with Nawam. Nawam now lives in Magan, uh, in Holland, where he uh, runs a, a, a Tibetan spiritual center. Um, anyway, I, I left Cornell uh, ready to go to Borneo, which is where I wanted to do my study. Uh, and the I got a, wrote a grant, and the grant was was uh, uh, okay by the National Institute of Health, but there was a budget crisis in the Congress about something, and the money was saying you can't get it till the next fiscal year, and so I was going to have to stay in Ithaca another year. And, I was just really getting tired of it because it was such a tiny little place, and, and uh, 
So I was offered a, a fellowship in psychiatry at the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, I thought, gee, that sounds interesting. Most of the word Seattle, I think, sounded interesting. But so I went there. It was a program that was supposed to train anthropologists who were getting ready to go abroad in some basic aspects of, of projected testing, or kind of psychological testing. It was a really stupid idea to train anthropologists to use TAT and Rorschach and draw a man test, and then go to some foreign cultural setting and sort of try these things out. And it was, a, it was a, an idea that had been rejected years before. Uh, but I, I didn't know that until I got back there. And when I got back there and found out what it was, I was getting ready to go back to Ithaca. And, and they said, oh, don't go, because you're the only person that has the fellowship that actually meets the specification. And if you leave, you know, we'll lose our funding. And, and, and so I was offered the chance to do something else rather than studying psychological tests. And so I said, yeah, I'd like to study psychiatry. So I became, for a year, uh, an unofficial third year resident in psychiatry and, and, and went around and had inpatients and outpatients and therapy groups and, and learned how to be a psychiatrist at least uh, for a year. Uh, and that was most interesting as well. Uh, after that, uh, uh, the money had come, but my wife had, was uh, getting ready to give birth to our first child, and so we decided this was not a good time to travel off overseas. So I, I, I accepted an offer of employment here. My old alma mater, Sac State, came down here and taught for a year, and then we went off to the island of Borneo, uh, where I did a study of a people called the Lundaya. Uh, and most of my study was focused on their systems of traditional uh, marriage practices and how they had become Christians and modern and all kinds of other ways, but they still retained uh, that rather complex, elaborate system of marriage exchanges. So, so I studied that. Uh, I came back uh, uh, to Sacramento and I wrote my dissertation. And, uh, and then a couple of years later, uh, the University of California at Davis was building out their department of psychiatry. And uh, one of the people on the new faculty there uh, was someone that I'd done some research with up in Seattle, found out that I was you know, across the causeway. And so I was invited to take a position over there. So I left Sac State and became an assistant clinical professor of behavioral biology and psychiatry at the University of California, Davis. And, uh, I went over there and, uh, and was involved in uh, training medical students and, and uh, doing research uh, and, and supervising the training of psychiatric residents. Uh, but I did that for a couple of years, and, but I felt you know, out of place amongst all these, again, physicians who kind of all saw the world in exactly the same way, and I missed anthropology. And after all, I was a PhD, and these were all MDs, and I somehow felt like I was a fish out of water. And, uh, and uh, so I, 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 I stayed over there part time, and I came back over here full time. Uh, and for a number of years, the then governor, Jerry Brown, had to sign a special waiver to allow me to be participating in two retirement systems, the UC retirement system and the, 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 the CSU, or the, the, whatever the PERS retirement system. Uh, so I went back and forth, commuted back and forth, and was involved in the development of our, uh, our medical teaching hospital on Stockton Boulevard, putting that all together. Uh, and teaching over here, I trained anthropology students from Sac State over at the hospital. I ran something called the Psychiatric Anthropology Research Project. Uh, one of the students who was involved in that project was Gilbert Hurt, who did a, uh, a, a, a sort of uh, symbolic analytical study of symbols in the psychiatric uh, walk ward at the hospital, uh, then went off and uh, received the last four-year Fulbright to Australian National University and became a very, very famous person. And probably the certainly most famous uh, scholar that ever studied at this university is probably Gil Hurt, who's now published some 24 books and, I don't know, 500 articles and, and been awarded all kinds of things. Uh, and that came out of, uh, of, of the work that he did over there. Uh, the, uh, the fall of, uh, of, of Saigon uh, in 1975 evoked uh, uh, a large diaspora of uh, willing and unwilling uh, refugees fleeing uh, the, the chaos left behind the American involvement in Southeast Asia. So beginning in 1975, for about five or six years, I was, I was involved uh, in assisting universities and elementary schools and high schools and hospitals and prisons and courts 
uh, uh, dealing with uh, what having to deal with, with all of these people coming from Southeast Asia. 